I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. When we think about an example of success, we often list professional athletes as part of that elite group. But when you get into the data, according to my guest coming up here shortly, 78% of professional athletes go bankrupt within three years of their playing career. So why is that? Well, when you get into the data even further, 87% of those people came from homes that were at or below the poverty level. In short, they were actually programmed as kids to be poor. Now, as controversial as that may sound, there are certain set points or anchors that we establish when we're young children, usually between the age of one and seven. And those set points or those key decisions become those that we use the rest of our lives. So what does that mean in business or in leadership? Well, the people that are running our companies and in front of our teams and working with our organization and our clients are primarily working from those set points. Put another way, as Einstein once said, that the decision that we have to make in our life is, are we living in a friendly universe or a hostile universe? Those of us who believe the former are going to be much more engaged and productive at work and those that believe the latter are not. So what's the trick? What's the secret sauce? Part of what my next guest talks about is the power of gratitude, deep, intense, long-standing efforts to be able to rewrite those core beliefs that were established when we were kids so that we begin to believe that we are worthy, trustworthy, living in a friendly universe, and that we have the capacity to be able to be successful as the way we see it. Tony Child is the founder and owner of Elevated Worldwide, where their mission is to elevate businesses worldwide through the daily process of creating habits that produce desired results. He focuses on helping companies reach their goals while implementing positive change in their lives of its employees with time-tested and research-based processes. Tony Child on the business of intuition. So Tony, thanks for being a guest on the show. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I wanted to ask you, you are obviously a master and a person who's been studying and trying to understand what one, what is success? And then two, how do we get there? And I'm really curious and to find out, you know, what is your method for that? How do you help companies and organizations, athletes and so forth, get to that, that place? But before I go there, I want to know a little bit about you. I want to know, is there something in your past or a series of things that kind of sparked your interest in this? What, what made you say, I want to do this sort of work? Was it an event? Was it a mentor, a person? Or was it just a series of things? What got you into this? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, First of all, really excited to be here, Dean. Thank you. I enjoy your podcast. So I'm just really excited for the opportunity to to collaborate with you today and to to chat about a few things. So to give you a little bit about a history of where I'm from. So I spent 15 years in banking, in corporate banking, retail banking. I've done everything from tellering all the way to executive management, where you know, I oversaw the the sales curriculum for a few thousand employees, and and while I was in the bank, uh, they I would be sent out to different trainings, different workshops to bring in different curriculums that we could create to help increase the sales of the bank that I was at. And so, it was just over ten years ago I was sent with my boss to a training out of Harvard. It was based on the book The Happiness Advantage by Sean Aker. He's a you know great researcher out of Harvard there, and. I, I walked into the 
to the workshop with my boss. My boss is sitting right next to me. And the first thing that the instructor said was, if you change the way you see things then the things you see will change. And Mm. I literally laughed out loud. I nudged my boss. I said, can I go? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I was having (laughs) nothing of it. I was having nothing of it. And she said, if you want to get fired, you'll leave. And so I was like, all right, all right, I'll stay. And that three hours changed my life, changed every facet mm. of my life. I was getting degrees in, in you know, math and accounting, business management. I ditched all of them <laughs> and I switched all my degrees in college. I was like a semester away from graduating, switched all of them to communications, positive psychology. I just wanted to understand the mind at a deeper level. And so that event, that three hours catapulted uh, now several companies. I'm a part of several companies and help thousands of people all across the world. And in particular, professional athletes, NFL athletes, Olympians, I help them transition out of their careers. So uh, it's just been an amazing journey from that one little event. So you obviously had a shift of perspective, a mind, a mind shift. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of give us what was it and what did it become? Yeah. So, I mean, I've heard about personal development and thinking grow rich, but I had never read it. I thought it was all just foo-foo, woo-woo, like did not want to have anything to do with it. And so that first sentence by that instructor, it kind of triggered this like, oh, this is one of those workshops, one of those like Mm woo-woo workshops, you know? Mm -hmm. And the next three hours was data after data and study after study of groups or individuals that when they would change their thoughts from negative or neutral to positive, how the results would dramatically change. And the first data point or the first set of research that they shared, I was like, okay, that's interesting. Then they shared another one. I was like, okay, that's a little bit more interesting. And then another one. And and by the time the three hours was done, I was like hook, line and sinker. Like, okay, I get it. Yep, I'm I'm all in. I want to study positive psychology. I want to understand the power of the mind. I want to st- understand neutrality. Like, I want to understand these things. And it just caused into me massive curiosity. All right. So obviously, you and I are brothers from a different mother. I can see that already. And I I, I do I completely agree with what you said that the the state of our mind creates the experience we have. We have a model that I didn't create, but somebody else did. Basically, it's OAR, and you work your way backwards. And R stands for results, which is what we often are thinking about. It's physically uh, tangible. The A stands for an action, meaning that if you do a certain thing, you should get a certain result. We train our kids. We train our employees about do this, you should get that. But of course, that doesn't always work. But then the O stands for observer. It stands for basically your mindset, your your perspective. And I, another great little quote was behavior follows, per, uh, be, yeah, behavior follows perception that a perception is really what creates a behavior or the effectiveness of that behavior. So I get it, man, I get it. So, and I think that others will hopefully understand this as well. My question is this, sounds really good. And, and I think some people might be struggling with this is to say, Tony, man, I hear you, but I have so many triggers Mm -hmm. and so many things in my life, the people I surround myself with, the habits that I've created, some of them in mental habits, that while I understand that feeling good will create a good result, how do I unhitch myself from a pattern of thinking that has typically been there to keep me in the place that I've been in for a long time. In fact, my identity is somewhat wrapped up in that. How do I make that shift? So the first thing I would share is just understanding the difference between conscious and subconscious. So, you know, the research shows that three to 7% of my day, my life is conscious awareness. 93 to 97% is subconscious. It's below conscious. So all these triggers, all these habits, They're dramatically controlling our lives, like dramatically. And when I would go to trainings, so I would do trainings all the time at the work or at the bank, it was all conscious awareness is get your notepad out and let's just write down some good data points. Let's write down some good things. And now I need you to go implement them. That's all conscious awareness. 
when you really want to make some major shifts, it's about being aware of, all right, what's underneath the hood? What's the subconscious things that are going on? And so, you know, as, as, as people look to their life, if they look to the future and they say, okay, you know, I, I, I want to 10 X what I'm doing, then it's okay. Well, what do you think you need to 10 X? Well, I need to be more confident. I need to be braver. I need to take more risk. I need to be, you know, more loving on myself and others, whatever it is, like it's this quest that I have to become something that I'm not. I've got to go out and become this person that innately is not me. And if we were to rewind the tapes, so Dean, let's rewind the tapes. Let's go back to a child of one and a half, two years old. If we describe the characteristics of a one and a half, a two-year-old, a three-year-old, like what are some of the characteristics you would you would use to describe a three-year-old or a two-year-old? Open. Open. Accepting, playful, agile, emotional. Yeah. All those things. Quick to forgive, brave, confident. Yes. Like they they just, they're persistent as hell. They will just be, they will persist and persist and persist until they get what they want. If if you ignore them, they just get louder. They they don't get softer. If you're in an airplane with a one-year-old that has that is dirty, hungry, or tired, they don't care who's in the airplane. They're right. going to scream until you take care of them. And, and so innate in all of us are all of these characteristics. Now, what happened was we started to make decisions about life really early on based on warped data. So here's an example of this. Let's say you're driving in the car, you're driving, and your mom is in the passenger seat, and you got a child in the back seat. And all of a sudden, as you're driving, you hear out of the back seat, Grandma, your nose is huge. As a dad, what are what do we do? That's our child that just told grandma that is that her nose is huge. What do we do to the child? What do we say? That's not appropriate. That's not nice. Of course, grandma looks pretty. You know, that's you know, we basically we would scold the the we potentially could scold the, the young child for yeah. saying something. So we tell the young child, yeah. hey, we don't tell grandma her her nose is huge. But guess what? Right. The fact is, there's a fact that's playing at play here. What's the fact? Grandma's nose is huge. And this child is just calling a fact out. The child is just saying, grandma's got a huge nose comparative to other noses. Like, and it's right. a no big deal thing to the child. And when we correct the child as an adult, we say, no, we don't say that. We don't do that. Now the child, here's what happens. Child makes a decision about yeah. how to play in life. And Correct. the decision at that moment is I can't say the truth. I got to right. tell people what they want to hear. And then in turn, they'll tell me what I want to hear. And we just ignore the actual fact and truth about things. And Absolutely. then they do that the rest of their life. Yes. And now they're 50 years old and they wonder why they can't tell the truth and why they can't tell people just the way that it is. Because and they don't realize that that, do that is that. subconscious. Yes. So, that's, so that's, the, that's the work. So then... The the, uh, the 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 rub is subconscious is not conscious. Mm -hmm. So then how can we get to, how do we use the conscious brain to get to a conscious, unconscious part of our personality? How do we get to that part such that we can add conscious awareness to it so that we can eventually change it? Yeah. So there's all different, there's different modalities to be able to do that. Therapy, coaching, just journaling. There's look at your results, look at your behaviors, look at your beliefs, look at the things that you hold about life. And it's just like, where did that come from? Why do I believe mm -hmm. that? And it's your, it's our willingness as human beings to look at a result and say, okay, I caused that result, but what was I believing that caused the result? And, and if I were to rewire that belief, what would happen to my result? Would my result change if I were to change the belief about it? So you're it's using our willingness the, you're using, to go deep on that. You're using the thread of beliefs to be able to find subconscious or unconscious, subconscious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so if you were to work with a, an executive or let's say it's an athlete, give me an example, Tony, where you worked with somebody to be able to help them uncover what their belief was 
so that we could get to that subconscious and then maybe to rewrite, I'm assuming we need to rewrite some of these subconscious decisions yeah. that it may have worked when we were one and a half. And I'm sorry, at 50, it doesn't necessarily work. So yeah. how do we then, one, find out what the source is and then two, rewrite the code? Yeah. So again, ha- just being aware, like most, we're just unaware. We don't know what we don't know. It's mystery. So if I'm completely unaware of something, I don't even know that it exists. And so it's the, like, when, when I went to that workshop, I had no clue that this whole realm of personal development, positive psychology was even a thing. Cause I just mm-hmm. was unaware of it. I right. was completely oblivious to it. And so what happened with me was I had somebody come up to me and say, Tony, like, why, why don't you make a million dollars a year? And it was like, well, I, I can only make a hundred thousand. And, and that was my belief. Like that was my like cap. That was the thing that it's like, I'm only going to make maybe $200,000 in my lifetime. Making a million dollars didn't even enter my brain as a realm of possibility. And then, you know, one of my mentors said, well, do you want to make your annual income, your monthly income? It's like, hmm. well, yeah, of course. It's like, all right, we've got to rewire some things. We've got to rewrite, rewrite some things because your beliefs right now will never like, it's not programmed to take you there. So now fast forward with athletes. Okay. So I I share that as kind of a backdrop. Now let's go to athletes. So what percentage of athletes go bankrupt within three years of their playing career? Do you know? know I don't know, but I I have a feeling like it's a lot more than we think. 78%. Wow. 78% of professional athletes go bankrupt within three years of their playing career. And my question is they have the best, the very best financial people advising them how is it that they could go bankrupt within three years like how how does that even happen and then i started to dive deeper yeah i started to go go deeper in my research of like all right let's let's dive deeper into this so i started to research what percentage of professional athletes come from poverty or below poverty levels Hmm. what do you think on that statistic what percentage of professional athletes from came from poverty or below poverty levels? My sense, gut sense would be probably, you know, three quarters, maybe between 50 and 100. 87%. Wow. 87%. They are literally programmed to go broke. Mm. Their beliefs about money, their beliefs about spending, their beliefs about everything is I'm poor. Mm-hmm. They've literally taken that identity on. Now they can have all the riches thrown at them on the planet, but they are literally programmed to be poor. And so as the work I do with professional athletes, it's like, all right, so you just barely entered your career. Let me teach you that if you don't change some things, you're going to go bankrupt. Mm-hmm. And here's, and, and it's just making them aware. And once they're aware, it's like, oh my heavens, you're right. And, and then we just rewire. We just go through and we help them figure out like how to rewire their brain to be more of abundant mindset and rich mindset or wealth mindset than poor or lack mindset. Okay, so uh, I'm an athlete. I've, I've made it big time. I've got millions of dollars coming in all the time. I'm eventually going to stay at the mid thirties. Maybe I'm 40. I'm no longer an athlete. 87%, no, 78% of me, of us are, is going to go bankrupt. For a period of time, though, Tony, I was, as the athlete, I experienced wealth. Mm-hmm. I experienced probably from our societal perspective, the paradigm that we all share, I was at the pinnacle of what wealth looks like. Not only wealth of money, but experience and fame and all the stuff that we sort of wrap around that. Why doesn't some of that stuff rub off on my brain so that it sticks after I have finished my sports? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. So Dr. Maxwell Maltz actually studied that very specific thing in, so he was a Nobel prize winning author, doctor. He wrote the book called psycho cybernetics. Have you ever read that book? Yeah. Right. Okay. So a cybernetic, for those that don't know what a cybernetic is, a cybernetic is a mechanism that will set, it's a set point. It will create a set point in you know, a thermos or a, or a thermo or a thermostat, not thermometer, a thermostat, your cruise control, rockets. It's it's what brings things back on course. Mm. So 
you know, if, if I have a cybernetic in my, I'm going to be driving down to California later tonight. And so if I'm driving, I'm going to put my cruise control on. And when I go up a hill, I know my car is going to slow down. And then when I crest the hill, my cybernetic will kick in. It'll say, nope, here's your set point. And it will bring me back to my set point. When I go down the hill, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. And then when I get down the hill, my set point will kick back in. My thermostat does the same thing. Temperature gets higher. It will bring it back down to the set point. Temperature gets lower. It'll bring it back up to the set point. What, what Dr. Maltz found is that everyone has a cybernetic. It's a psycho cybernetic within each of us. They're set hmm. points. And everyone has a set point regarding love. There's so much research hmm. that shows that if a, if a parent or if a child is part of a divorced family, the percentages are crazy high that that person will get a divorce in their lifetime. Because that's their set point. That's what they saw. That's what they experienced. That's the beliefs of what how they saw relationships. Mm-hmm. And so the set point for athletes is poverty, 50,000 or lower. Mm-hmm. That's their set point. They go out and they make millions of dollars in their career and then it's done. The cybernetic that Dr. Maxwell Maltz found is that it must go back to the set point unless they learn how to change the set point. And that's the work that I do with them. It's like, all right, we just got to change your set point. If you don't change it, your cybernetic will kick in and you'll come right back down to your set point. It happens, biggest loser. If you've watched the show, the biggest loser, they go and they they release all this weight. They lose tons of weight. Right. The percentages that, of them that get it all back are so high. Why? Because they didn't change the cybernetic. They, they okay. lost all the weight. They gained it all back. So I don't want you to give away your proprietary secret sauce here, but I do want to ask the question, which I think some people are asking is, use an example, take somebody that you have worked with before, if you possibly can, how do you change that set point? Yeah. So the first part, the first part, this is one of my favorite quotes by one of the brightest minds of our time, Albert Einstein. He said this, he said, the greatest decision you'll ever make in your lifetime is whether you believe you live in a hostile or a friendly universe. Mm. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your lifetime is whether you believe you live in a hostile or a friendly universe. The way I've changed it is the greatest decision I'll make in my lifetime is whether I believe I live in a not enough or more than enough universe. And and the what I see with most people that I work with is the first thing I have to do with them is for them to be able to see a life outside of themselves that there's always enough. Because most Mm -hmm. people are programmed to see life through a lens of not enough. There's not enough time. There's not enough food on the counter. There's not enough love in this planet. There's not enough money in my bank account. There's not enough resources in my job. And this idea of not enough, it stems from an inner image of somebody looking in the mirror and seeing I'm not smart enough. I'm not creative enough. I'm not brave enough. I'm not this enough, that enough. And that lens then begins to recreate. So point in case is the lens of confirmation bias. So confirmation bias term in psychology, it means that I am literally programmed to see life that will confirm to me what I believe about the planet, what I believe about life. And I will look for points and data points to confirm to me my beliefs. So if I have a belief that there's not enough, then I will begin to see life and it will confirm to me, yep, told you you didn't have enough love. You just got divorced. Told you you didn't have enough money. You just lost that. Told you you didn't have enough. And it's just this confirmation that keeps coming. So it's learning how to flip that and and do that. One of the things that I do with people is we start off with intense practices of gratitude, Mm. like intense practices. It's not just write down five things you're grateful for every day. I have people listen to audios while they go to sleep at night. I have people write in journals, multiple things. They read stuff out loud. All I'm doing is using different ways that the body learns that the subconscious will respond to through repetition. And we start to recreate a lens through Mm -hmm. the words that they speak, the audios they listen to, the things they're writing down, all of those components through repetition begin to change the subconscious, change that lens. And gratitude is... As Cicero said, the great emperor, he said that gratitude is not a virtue. It is the parent of all virtues. Hmm. And I truly believe that that a grateful person 
It is impossible to see or feel lack if I'm conditioned to look at life through what I have instead of what's missing. And so the very first thing I do with people is we go through an intense month of gratitude Hmm. to just flip the brain, to shift the brain from this hostile to friendly universe. Does that answer your question? That's a great example. And I love it. And I think there's a lot of good merit in that. I want, I love it. You mentioned before we started this conversation, I asked you, what's one thing you want people to really hear? And you said to trust themselves, relay the trusting oneself to gratitude. So if I look in the mirror and I'm conditioned to see life through a lens of not enough, it's because deep down inside, I don't believe I'm enough. I don't believe that I have the answers to the problems that I have in my life. I believe that it's outside of me, that I've got to ask everyone else what they think. When when people get these amazing pings, these amazing ideas that come from, you know, this like invisible universal force, whatever it is, they get this like idea that says, you should try this, you should do this. They ruin it by going and asking a dad or a parent or a mom or a spouse, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Hmm. They take their power and now they give it to somebody else. Hmm. And they allow that other person to determine this this inspirational, amazing, life-changing thought. They put it in the hands of a human that will now share with them based on their personal history and experience what they should do with that thought. Instead of just saying, huh, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. I'm going I'm to just do it and we're going to see what happens. And, and we're so afraid as humans to just try to get outside of the box, to try things that are not normal, to do the creative things. I love what you said in your TEDx talk of just playing. Like we are so afraid as adults of just playing because we're afraid mm-hmm. of getting it wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and like when you get an idea, try it. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with trying the idea. See where it leads you. And, and when we have this expectation of outcome and it doesn't go as I expected, I now believe that I failed and that I'm a mm-hmm. failure. And it's this definition of success and failure that gets people completely wonky of like, just try. And so yeah. deep down inside, as we look about gratitude, it's when I can begin to see life through a lens of, man, there is always enough. Look at what's around us. We are so blessed. I begin to look in the mirror and see myself that way. A bit like, man, I, I am so like, look at this body. It's amazing what happens in my body. I don't even have to think and my eyes blink and my heart pumps and my, my, my eyelashes move and like all of the amazingness of my body. It just happens. And I begin to look in the mirror and it's like, man, I love this creation that's there. And when I do that, I begin to trust myself. Mm. I begin to see that, man, I I might be enough. I I actually might be enough for me to be able to go and do the things that I want in life and to take my life to a whole nother level. And when I can be that through gratitude, then I'll start to trust those pings. I, I won't give my power outside to somebody else and say, hey, what do you think about that? It's like, I just turn the question. Anybody ask me that question, by the way, what do you think? I turn the question as like, I don't know. What do you think? You're the one that got the thought. What do you think about it? So right. there, there's your. So vision, scale this up. You got several people, say within a team, an organization that has gone through this process. <clears throat> Their gratitude is much better than say it was before. They trust themselves better. What would that look like? Yeah. So on teams and organizations, I've done a lot of study through Gallup and on all of the engagement polls. So people that are engaged, unengaged, disengaged. And here's what I found. A person that looks at life through a hostile lens is either unengaged or disengaged. Mm. uh, Something's out to get them. Yep. They will literally look that their boss is out to get them. They're victim in every situation. They bring no solutions to their problems. They just complain about the problems. There's so much research around disengaged and unengaged. Mm -hmm. When you get into engaged employees, 
That's where the magic happens. Unfortunately, in the world as a whole, only 15% of the population are engaged at work. Yeah. I believe that 15% of the population actually looks at life through a lens of friendliness. Mm. That 85% is looking through a lens of hostile, out to get me, dangerous world. And when we can shift that and we can get people from unengaged or disengaged to engaged, like just imagine if companies turned their engagement numbers, just 10%, what would happen? Mm -hmm. Those, those, that's the power of gratitude though. When you can get your, your employees grateful where they're just like, man, this is great. I love coming here. We've got more than enough opportunities. They will begin to shift and see problems as opportunities. The problem won't stifle them. They won't see a problem and then be like, uh, uh, I, I, I can't solve this problem. I need help. I got I to gotta have all these other things. They'll just trust themselves. Like, I got this. I'm going to go Google it. I'm going to go to YouTube and I'm going to try. I'm going to figure this out. This is a really cool situation I want to figure out here. They'll look at problems as opportunities. That's what engaged people do. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Tony, really good work, man. I, I, I really appreciate your passion and your clarity. And I love the fact that you that you have some data to support it, because I think there are some out there that value that and, and, and you provided that. How can people connect with you, learn more about what you're about? Yeah, just come find me on my website, tonychild.com. I've got all my social media links there. You can come follow me on social media. Uh, we run events here in Utah. It's called Pivot Point. It's these the events that happened to me. So I went mm. to that event and it's like, oh my goodness, what just happened? Like I, I want to provide those for other people where they come to an event and, and it just completely 180s their life. It's the pivot mm-hmm. point to their life of like, okay, I'm ready. I want to, I want to make a quantum leap. So we run those in Utah, come to my website, check them out. We'd love to, we'd love to have any of your, your listeners come. So fantastic. Great stuff. Keep up the good work. Awesome. Thanks Dean. You bet. Thank you for listening to the business of intuition. If you enjoyed the show, Please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.